I'm Ata. Um, the S stands for Sione. Very common name. Very common. Very common name uh, throughout the Pacific, meaning John. Um, but I just go by my, my middle name, Ata. So um, today I'll, I'll be speaking on the theme of the, symposi the symposium from a Tongan indigenous uh, perspective on the meanings of Lamanite. Um, you know, I heard uh, Armando talking about, uh, you know, the Latinization of Mormonism throughout the world and becoming 50%, um, but also with, <laughs> with Tong Tongans, Tongans also have a, a similar statistic of being the most uh, Mormon nation uh, in the world. Um, but I think this this goes hand in hand with the Lamanite narrative that is being that is being used within the various contexts of uh, Lamanite identity within uh, you know the North American context, the Latin American context, and then within the Pacific. Um, so the title of my paper is uh, "Weathering as a Rose: Tongan Indigeneity, Mormonism, and the Curse of the Lamanites." So in speaking uh, of the of the Lamanites as being the principal ancestors. Uh, of the American Indians in the Book of Mormon, the prophet Joseph Smith went on to proclaim in uh, Doctrine and Covenants, uh, section 49, 24, uh, before the great day of the Lord shall come, Jacob shall flourish in the wilderness and the Lamanite shall blossom as a rose. As, uh, as the narrative of the descendants of the Lamanites was later extended to include the peoples of the Pacific and Latin America, uh, and Latin America uh, the, this connection to the Book of Mormon and Christianity contributed to the large growth of the LES church throughout these regions. Um, this prophecy of uh, blossoming as a rose by the prophet Joseph Smith has been important when speaking to the blessings of Lam the Lamanite uh, members receive in accepting the gospel, that they may uh, believe, or, and that, that they may, and I'm, I'm pulling from Dr. Carmen section tw uh, three, verses 20, um, that they may come to the knowledge of their fathers, that they might know the promises of the Lord, um, and that they might believe in the gospel and rely up, up, upon the merits of Jesus Christ and be glorified through faith in his name and through repentance uh, they might, uh, that they might be saved. Amen. Thus, the prophecy of the Lamanites is uh, blossoming as a rose uh, that was still and is still being perpetuated through, through church doc doctrine and policy is not only a tool of conversion, but as a way to suppress, erase, and replace indigenous uh, epistemologies, ontologies, and accepting the Mormon faith and moving away from being uh, Lamanite altogether. Um, the this presentation will discuss how Mormonism and meanings of Lamanites uh, played out very differently uh, in Tonga uh, that allowed for Tongan, Tongan indigenous expression to be maintained and tolerated um, that was not given to other Lamanite groups. Um, this allowed for a phenomenal growth of the Mormon church in Tonga and the blossoming of the church membership. Uh, the church provided pathways of education for Tongan members uh, at Church College, now BYU Hawaii, um, and also um, a religious migration to uh, a mass religious migration to uh, the Salt Lake or to Salt Lake City, the headquarters of the Mormon Church, um, where uh, the first Tongan stake was established, uh, which was the first non English stake uh, in, in, the, in the United States. Um, today, there are five Tongan stakes in the Salt Lake area, um, and it's, uh, it, it is one of the biggest uh, Tongan communities in, in, in the United States. Um, Today, uh, today, church statistics claim Tonga to have the largest population of uh, LDS members. Um, despite the blossoming of Tongan Mormon membership, over time, church policies shifted, uh, which began to slowly restrict indigenous practices and expressions to align more uh, with mainstream go uh, gospel Mormon culture that have created tensions for Tongan members. Through tensions of Tongan indigeneity and Mormonism, this blossoming of Lamanites as arose uh, into the gospel culture comes with uh, at the expense and the withering of indigenous culture and Lamanite identity. So, uh, just with positionality, um, sorry. Um, I just want to position myself within the context of this presentation. I do not sp uh, speak for all Tongans or all Tongan Mormons, but I am speaking from my own limited experiences, having been raised uh, within the Tongan Mormon community um, in Salt Lake City, Utah, and meaning maintaining close connections to and regularly going to Tonga. I'm, not, I'm no longer active in the church, and although I, don't, I no longer identify as being Mormon or LDS, I do acknowledge that uh, I am Mamonga, 
uh, which is the transliterated word for Mormon in the Tongan Tong language, which is an important aspect to who I am uh, and how I identify as being Tongan. Um, So uh, to better understand uh, Mormonism in Tonga, it is also important to understand how the kingdom of Tonga was created as a Christian nation. Our first modern king, Taufa Hau, or Dupo I, gave the land and uh, land the people to God to protect Tonga from uh, European colonialism. Um, and our, our national motto um, speaks to our Tongan Christian identity, or in English, um, God and Tonga are my inheritance. So I think um, a quote by Elder John H. Grover um, beautifully kind of captures uh, the essence of uh, Tongan Christianity. Um, his talk, uh, this, this quote is taken from a talk that was titled The Power of Keeping the Sabbath Day Holy and was given, uh, general, uh, was given at General Conference in 1984. The small island kingdom of Donga lies immediately next to the international date line. So it is the first country in the world to greet the Sabbath day. They moved the date lines. It's not true anymore, but uh, <laughs> it is a small country and in the counting of the wor world, a poor country. But years ago, a wise Tongan king decreed that the Sabbath would be kept holy in Donga forever. Modern civilization has come uh, in many ways to Donga. If, uh, if one goes to the capital of Nupualofa on a weekday, he finds usual heavy traffic of trucks uh, and cars and the bustle of thousands of shoppers making the regular purchases from well-stocked stores and markets. One sees people uh, line up to view the latest movies and to rent videos. One can watch modern buses whisk tourists off to catch their jet planes or observe the speed and clarity of satellite call to the United States. The streets are crowded and business is good. But when Sunday dawns on the kingdom of Tonga, a transformation takes place. If one goes downtown, he sees deserted streets, no taxis or buses, crowds of people, all stores, all markets, all the markets, all the movie theaters, all the offices are closed. No planes fly, uh, no ships come in or, in or out. Um, no commerce takes place, no games are played. Uh, the people go to church. Uh, Tonga is remembering to keep uh, the Sabbath day holy. Um, not much has changed. There has been a little bit of social change that has changed in Tonga on Sundays. Um, but I remember when I started to go to Tonga a lot more often, I would tell people that Sundays were like Christmas and it was like the worst because everything was closed. So, um, so, I think a lot of the time when we think about Mormonism in Tonga because of the large growth, uh, a lot of Tongans don't think about the, the history of the Mormon church in Tonga. Um, because the Mormon church did struggle in Tonga for a very long time. Uh, the church had, uh, or the, the, more, the LDS church had already established itself in Hawaii and Aotearoa, New Zealand in the, in the 1800s or the 19th century. Um, but because Tonga was already a, a, a heavily Christian nation, the missionaries uh, struggled to convert members, adjust to local customs, and missionary work in Donga. Uh, and missionary work in Donga was closed on, on multiple occasions. The shift towards the conversion uh, of Donga to Mormonism, um, to more Mormonism began, I, I, uh, I would say, began with uh, missionary work of Tongan missionaries and Tongan family missionaries serving among their own people. Uh, the church also made accommodations to follow local indigenous customs. That not had been that not had been offered to very many uh, places in the world, things such as allowing missionaries to wear uh, traditional Tongan attire, uh, inclusion of Tongan composed hymns uh, in the Tongan hymn book, um, and even uh, aligning the the times of worship to uh, to the other Tongan the, the other Tongan churches uh, in Tonga. Um, and then this is also a time when this church started to to talk about the the narrative of the Pacific, Hagoth, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Lamanites. Sorry, my notes are on here. So blossoming as a rose, Tongue of Mormonism, 
Thong Ah Mormonism uh, and Lamanite identity. So uh, the church not only became, the church, the, the Mormon church, the actual physical, physical building, not only became a place of Christian religious worship, but similar to other Tongan churches, it became a space where Tongan indigenous traditions, protocols, ceremonies, and, and uh, performance performances were were um, were held. Um, and this is kind of where a lot of Tongans began to uh, to be attracted to to the to the Tongan Mormon Church. The Tongan uh, the church also establishes a church college called Alion High School, which is around the same time they're establishing uh, church colleges throughout. The Pacific region in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Hamilton, and Pisenga and uh, Samoa, and then the Church College in Hawaii, which uh, is BYU uh, Hawaii today. Um, so the the Lamanite uh, narrative also began to take hold uh, within Tongan members. Uh, speaking with Debbie Takaili, there were there were um, songs composed, um, Lamanite songs composed for Tongans. To, in order to connect to um, to the to the narrative um, of the of the Lamanite identity uh, in the Pacific, so there was there was large growth in uh, in 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 Tonga, but there was large uh, migrations of Tongans to Laia, and and then eventually to Salt Lake. Um, So my family was uh, one of the, among some of the early Tongan families to uh, migrate to Salt Lake City, Utah. It was my grandparents that brought the, um, them and their 14 kids. Um, my, my dad followed my mom and they were, they were married in the Salt Lake Temple. So the, the church grew very quickly uh, in Salt Lake City. We, uh, they established a branch, which quickly turned into a ward, which turned into multiple wards, and then uh, which turned into multiple wards. And then in 1988, um, the church, uh, Asked the Tongan, the Tongan, uh, the Tongan members to uh, sing in in uh, general conference. What my friends are in this? What's important is about this uh, performance of uh, the, the Tongan choir. Um, I, I'm still going to do more research. Uh, this may be the first time that a choir has performed uh, a non-English uh, hymn uh, in in uh, in general conference. And a few a few later, uh, a few years later in Salt Lake City, Utah, um, the church, the Tongan members in the in the in Salt Lake, grew to a size where multiple churches, multiple wards were being established, um, and then uh, a Tong, the, the first Tongan stake was created uh, in in the United States. Uh, so this is the one year celebration of uh, the the Salt Lake, Utah Tongan stakes. It's important because this was a time where Tongans were still allowed to kind of have this type of exp uh, indigenous expression within the church using church facilities, um, using church facilities. So this is a, a Tongan Laka Laka. So this Tongan Laka Laka was uh, composed by uh, Devita Muli Kinikini. It was originally comp uh, composed in, uh, in Tonga um, for an occasion for the crown prince. And then uh, there was an occasion where for, that, that was for the church. And so he uh, created lyrics lyrics to this song that was talking about the life of Joseph Smith um, and also the first reason.
it's a very, very long composition, but um, just the, the parts where they get to the first vision, um, the baptism, I think there's a baptism part. Um, you can see kind of how they're using tongue and movements to kind of express the experiences of Joseph Smith in significant moments of um, the church's history. Withering as a rose. So Tongan indigeneity and the curse of the Lamanites. So um, some of the work that I'm doing in my PhD, oh, five minutes. Some of the work that I'm doing in my PhD is uh, speaking to a concept around Tongan indigeneity. Um, and the reason why I, I'm engaging with indigeneity within the Tongan context is a lot of it is, is confronting the colonization with, uh, in Tonga, because Tonga, um, Tonga has this narrative that uh, we were never colonized which has a lot of impl Im implications on our identity as Tongans in the Pacific, but even our affinity towards uh, being indigenous. Um, and so talking about indigeneity or Tongans as, as being indigenous really speaks against uh, colonization, speaks against uh, the, hev the heavy influence of Christianity, of Christianity in Tonga. And so um, I, I left the Tongan stake when there's, when there's two stakes, and then just kind of was on the side, uh, still closely tied to the to to the Tongan Mormon community. My family is still active, but I could just see the the different changes that are be, uh, that are happening um, to the, not only the Tongan stakes in Salt Lake, but the Tongan the Tongan Mormon Church in Tonga. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of language loss that is happening among the stakes uh, in Salt Lake City in Salt Lake. Um, when we first started as a stake, all three hours were in Tongan. And then eventually we went to just sacrament being in Tongan and then now it just kind of mixed depending on the stake in the ward. Um, restrictions started to be being um, put in place by the church of when we can use it. Before, you know, when we when we had the churches, we were allowed to kind of use the church uh, at our discretion. Now there's specific rules of, you know, you have to finish a funeral by 9 p.m. or you have to be out of the church by this time. Where for Tongans, you know, we operated very differently as far as set schedules starting and finishing but this is really disrupt uh our our um the way that we are operating within mormonism as Tongans. um there was also a ban on kava um in, in the church uh members were engaging in the drinking of kava a ceremonial drink throughout the pacific um and some Tongan, uh some Tongan uh congregations some Tongan uh leaders were including the kava in the temple Temple questions saying if you do you drink kava and if you drink kava then they wouldn't give you a temple recommend. And then uh, also there's uh, some other things is the ban of giving money uh, in traditional Tongan dances. So the giving of money in traditional Tongan dances dances is just part of an old practice of giving gift giving during da during dances. This money is now the, kind of the new adaptation, but the the church ha has banned that which because these are central to a lot of the performances and the, the, um, the events that Tongans are having, um, it forces us to now go, go to different venues, paying for the, the high cost of the different venues and no longer, no longer using the, the, um, the church facilities um, for our, our uh, Tongan um, indigenous pers uh, pers perspectives. So, uh, and one of the last uh, things that I had regarding just withering as a rose um, within the Tongan Stakes is participating in trek. Growing up in the Tongan Stakes, and we never participated in trek. I always see all the, you know, the mainstream wards participating in trek. I'm like, I'd hate to do that. But like over the years, now I'm seeing Tongans uh, participating in trek, pulling the carts, wearing the clothes, and all these different things. Where before in the Tongan, uh, the, before in the Tongan Stakes. We would uh, praise the Tongan pioneers that really uh, assisted in the growth of the church in Tonga, but also the Tongan pioneers that made uh, that made their way to, uh, to to Salt Lake City in order to provide you know better opportunities for their family, better education for their uh, for their kids. Conclusion. <laughs> so really, with with my presentation, uh, I think. I'm really wanting to speak to you know this or juxtapose this idea of blossoming as a rose um, and withering as a rose. Blossoming as a rose is the conversion to the to the Mormon Church, 
and the withering is is just kind of giving up our indigenous identity, um, our, our, indigenous, our indigenous identity as Lamanites of the church. Um, and so I think when we're when we were talking about the question earlier about uh, the Day of the Dead and the church kind of making shifts towards these, it was kind of interesting interesting for me to hear this question because for Tongans, I feel like they're moving the other way because they've allowed us to move so far native, I guess. Now they're pulling back, uh, not allowing us to part to do the things that we uh, that we used to be able to do. 